This brief uh, video is intended to provide uh, some basic information on the background uh, for the book Layering for Learning. A little personal background. Most of my research and writing projects have focused on reading and study effectiveness in students of a wide age range, fourth graders through college students. Uh, I don't claim to have the breadth of experience of classroom teachers but I have studied the learning of students directly and in ways that are different from the perspective experienced by most educators. I think I can identify productive concepts and offer related examples uh, that can serve as suggestive guides to teachers. While a psychologist, I spent nearly 10 years contributing to a graduate program in instructional design and technology. We abbreviated this as, uh, as IDT. I like to say that I was the and technology contributor to the program. I was not trained as a classical instructional designer and I thought of myself more as having an interest in the role technology uh, might play to facilitate student learning. What I try to do for educators is to provide a coherent explanation of what the learner must do in one way or another during learning. Starting what, with what the learner does is a bit different from focusing on what the teacher does. I have a personal interest in what tasks or st strategies educators might suggest to encourage active and successful implementation of uh, the necessary cognitive activities that uh, contribute to learning. So what I hope to offer here is uh, it's fairly simple. First, I hope to identify important tasks that learners must accomplish in the process of learning. Second, I hope to identify external tasks that might be assigned or provided to encourage or mimic these important cognitive behaviors, uh, especially ones that uh, learners are unlikely to generate on their own. Finally, I will try to provide some ideas about how these external tasks might be offered uh, to learners using technology. Just to be clear, these, uh, these goals are also the goals of my book, just uh, $3 from, from Amazon. This video and the other videos in the series are not intended as a replacement for the reading of the book. Uh, I see the videos and the written products supporting each other. This is my short version of what I call the cognitive fundamentals. What is it that a learner must do to understand, store, and apply new information? Having some insights into what learners might do and what might go wrong are essential in attempting to facilitate their efforts. This will take a couple of minutes, uh, but it's certainly better than an entire course in cognitive uh, theory. Cognitive theory offers some basic assumptions about how learning happens. First, personal understanding is constructed as a combination of what is already known and new inputs. Two concepts are important here, existing knowledge and construction. What is already known? Learning is far easier when new experiences can be related to what is already known. It has been demonstrated that what we already know about a topic has a larger impact on new learning than what we tend to think of as aptitude. If some relevant experiences or knowledge exist, this knowledge must be activated to make connections possible. This means learners must think of or recognize the relevant existing knowledge, and this may or may not happen for multiple reasons. Second, what we know we construct. The notion of construction implies that understanding and retention require cognitive action. We take cognitive or mental action to build what might be convenient to describe as models. Model is kind of an all-purpose idea. By model, I mean a personal representation of all kinds of different things. What is a flower? How does rain happen? How do I argue for a position? When I claim activating existing knowledge or model is important, I mean in many situations 
we have relevant existing models and recognizing this existing content offers great advantage. New information may extend or conflict with these existing ideas, so it's important to constantly use new experiences to build toward more sophisticated and accurate models. Construction should not be thought of as a single type of action. Rather uh, than attempt to, to identify the many actions that may be involved, I'm going to try to keep things uh, a little more simple. Uh, finally, learning involves control and adjustment. Uh, first, the actions of thinking are under the control of the learner, and second, an important factor in the exercise of this control is based on whether the actions that have been implemented have been successful. Control and adjustment are often described together as metacognition, which involves kind of looking at and thinking about and directing your own thinking. Control applies that thinking is directed by purpose and by knowledge of self and task. Individuals will differ in the knowledge they can apply to exercise this control. What does the task I am trying to accomplish require? What makes this task difficult? How well do my existing skills and knowledge prepare me to take on this task? Adjustment come into play when the actions of thinking are implemented. Monitoring of the success of such actions reveal when the actions fail and recognition should trigger attempts to fix things up. For example, when we read, we often misunderstand something. This happens to all readers, and the solution is usually quite simple. We will read the content uh, that has been confusing or perhaps ask someone else for, assi uh, for assistance. The key to such fix-ups is the recognition of the confusion in the first place. Some tolerance of failure is actually important. If a cognitive skill such as reading comprehension were to proceed so, slow, so slowly that no misinterpretation of phrases or sentences ever occurred, the information would come in so slowly that keeping track of these ideas um, would be nearly impossible. In many cognitive skills, we must go fast and then fix our mistakes. It might be helpful to collectively describe the various cognitive actions I reference as uh, being made up of thinking behaviors. Cognitive construction results from thinking. The notion that thinking must occur for learning and retention uh, is not trivial. It sounds uh, simple, uh, but it you know, there's, it's really something of substance here. Uh, we typically accept that thinking is active and motivated. Mental activity is happening when we think. But such actions may or may not happen depending on whether a specific kind of thinking skill has been developed and whether or not a learner makes the effort to apply the necessary thinking skills. I believe considering what thinking involves is important for educators and for learners themselves. And a cognitive perspective allows the mental behaviors of thinking to be made uh, less abstract. Often um, we describe abstractions in terms of analogies. One way to deal with the abstract idea of thinking skills is to suggest that such skills are like something else we already know um, that's, that's tangible for us and, uh, and familiar. This is what I mean by using analogies to understand abstract and difficult to, 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 to describe phenomena. For example, model building would be an analogy. Creating a summary is often used as an analogy for boiling a lot of information down into a model. Uh, summarization, therefore, uh, would, would be an analogy for model building. Uh, imagining applications or possible examples would be analogies for mental actions that involve using an existing model to find new connections uh, of an existing model and, uh, and life experiences. So um, we're not saying these actions are exactly the same as cognitive behaviors, but they are, sim they are similar enough to give us some insight into what uh, important cognitive behaviors might be. Before moving on, I want to raise an important point. 
uh, which you may have already anticipated. The idea of analogies for mental actions can serve multiple purposes. To this point, I have used the concept of an analogy to try to make something quite abstract into something more concrete. Uh, the actions of cognition work something like this and this and this. Here are analogies for how cognition works. Since learning and thinking are biological processes, the analogy does not explain exactly how learning and thinking happen, but the analogy does establish a way to communicate uh, when we're trying to consider such important topics. Uh, in many cases, and this is my point here, analogies provide something more. When the analogy involves a tangible external task, um, involving a learner in such a task seems a logical way to encourage the actual and related cognitive activity of interest. Um, these analogies may suggest tasks that facilitate learning. So, for example, if creating a mental model explain, is explained as summarizing a set of experiences, asking a learner to create a summary would seem a possible way to encourage the necessary mental model creation. We can use external tasks to encourage thinking behaviors. This idea of using external tasks to encourage cognitive tasks is important in the perspective taken here. Educators might not use the terminology I'm using, but educators are constantly engaging learners with such external tasks. So some of these ideas may be more familiar uh, than when first seemed to be the case. My favorite example of using an external task to encourage thinking is the use of questions. Teachers are certainly familiar with the use of questions they ask hundreds a day. Students can ask each other questions and can even ask questions of themselves. Questions are an important part of education in general. Consider using a question to encourage various desired types of thinking behavior, an external task to encourage uh, an internal behavior. If you want to activate existing knowledge, you might ask questions about past experiences at the beginning of a lesson. If you want to encourage the monitoring functions of metacognition, you might provide learners questions they can, they can attempt to answer um, as or after they read. Questions can serve to encourage many different types of thinking behavior. Perhaps for many educators, this focus on the connection between external tasks and internal behaviors is just an effort that requires the educator to step back and ask him or herself, why do I do that? Why do I ask questions? Why do we, I re request students generate a summary or maybe a mind map? Why do I bring up a specific current political event while discussing a liter literary classic? In, in summary, external activities can be used to encourage mental activities. And what we're trying to develop here is uh, what, what are some of these connections and what are some of the external tasks we might use. Some additional points. It would be unfair if uh, I didn't acknowledge that things do get more complicated. A couple of points. First. The addition of external activities may not be necessary for some learners and because external activities only approximate the actual underlying cognitive behaviors, they involve some waste. Educators and, and learners might describe this as, a, as busy work. It is always better to be able to perform necessary cognitive activities without external direction or prompting. This is the desired end state of learning, uh, whether it's to read effectively, to study effectively, uh, or to, you know, to learn any complex cognitive task. However, um, complex cognitive skills are, uh, are difficult to learn, and uh, some obviously struggle. Hence, they can benefit from, uh, the benef from these external kinds of activities. This situation or this issue might be understood in terms of individual differences or in terms of the, stage, the stages learners go through as they develop uh, important skills. Those who struggle because of lack of experience or other reasons will likely benefit 
uh, from from methods that can't you know admittedly are a little bit wasteful, um, but they produce the desired results. However, hopefully, the uh, artificial experiences will help them develop cognitive skills that, in the long term, uh, do not do not depend on external tasks. I admit that uh, this situation is a dilemma for educators working in real uh, circumstances. What do you do when working with a group of students, some of whom would benefit and some who do, who do not need an external activity uh, to, to, pro to process the learning content uh, effectively? I, I don't know there's an easy answer to this, but I'm just bringing up something that uh, is already the case. And uh, how you deal with individual um, differences is, uh, is an important part of the, the challenge for all, for all teachers. A second issue, cognitive activities often must be performed with limited resources of time and attention. It is possible that the challenges of cognitive activity or, or external assigned tasks could overload um, both attention uh, and, the, and, and the end available time. R reading is an example I've used already. Um, reading comprehension is a real-time phenomena. Reading comprehension works best when things happen without distraction. So, for example, the frequent asking of questions while a learner is reading may provide useful metacognitive feedback, but can also be uh, somewhat detrimental to comprehension. Um, most of us in, in reading have learned to recognize naturally occurring failures uh, simply because we track whether things are making sense. Comprehension itself becomes a cue for whether action is required. Um, this, unfortunately, is not the case in all readers. And uh, uh, kind of a serious uh, and ironic problem for many readers is that those readers who struggle the most also are the, the readers who have less effective means of, of monitoring the moment-by-moment -moment success of their own efforts. Um, so again, on a situational and individual basis, external tasks may be helpful. Um, so a simple commitment to add external tasks is not the desired course of action here. If it were possible, the best solution would be to identify the needs of individual learners and add external tasks suited to the specific needs of these learners. More long term, uh, the goal should be to offer learners strategies for applying external tasks on their own. Uh, and we certainly discuss some of these uh, ideas in uh, our related materials. Uh, and eventually, perhaps, to get beyond the point at which any external task uh, is necessary. The book Layering for Learning explores the use of external tasks to encourage productive learning processes and the development of learning processes as applied specifically to the use of online information sources. So instead of learning from textbooks and commercial learning materials, such as workbooks, learning from the content presented on web pages and videos. There are many reasons uh, to use some of these resources, including cost and the notion that this type of content uh, is what we will be using more and more uh, as we rely more and more on online information. I like to draw the distinction between what I would, con uh, what I would describe as uh, an information source and an educational resource. Commercial providers or educators add elements to information sources to make them more productive uh, as educational resources. They create a context and provide background uh, intended to activate existing knowledge and, they and, and to focus the learner on specific things. They add tasks such as questions and discussion opportunities to encourage deeper thought, they use tasks such as questions to identify learner difficulties, and they help learners uh, respond to such difficulties with additional explanations. They identify learners with related interests and provide additional learning opportunities. Layering is my own term that is intended here to be descriptive. 
An online layering service allows the designer or the teacher or the teacher as designer to identify an information source online and then to add external elements to this information source before presenting the composite uh, to students. I think of this as layering elements on the original source. The guide I have created expands on the learning instruction ideas I have presented here. Uh, it identifies external tasks that are, that are helpful to learners and explains how best to present them to encourage learners to use such tactics on their own. Finally, the book identifies existing services teachers can use to, uh, to develop content in, in this way. Additional videos and information about the guide are available from the website uh, associated with this video series. Um, I hope you have found these comments uh, somewhat intriguing and I encourage you to explore uh, the more specific ideas presented in our book and uh, in the existing, the other existing online videos. Thanks.